So we start the recording. Today is the uh, first self class for the paper two worksheet for the work energy power chapter. Uh, we're gonna start discussing problems from here. So I hope that you have attempted some problems from here. You were given this as a homework for as much relaxedly comfortably that you can attempt. If you have any specific problem that you can talk about it or I can choose some problem of my own to dis explain these stuffs. Can write them in the chat window. Okay, okay, problems should always be given in the uh, all chat. <coughs> Don't write me directly, preferably write in the everyone. <coughs> so, Asif give a recommendation for number two. So, I'll start discussing number two. And in the meantime, if any of you have more problems, please feel free to share as a message M to everyone. Have a look. Number two says, Figure 1.1 is a block diagram of a power station. The four boxes represent different parts of the power station. The first box is labeled boiler. <coughs> so, oil is going to boiler. And each of the other three boxes should contain one of the labels from the following list generator, motor, transformer, transformer turbine, solar panel. Use figure 1.1, label the boxes using the words from the list. So, boiler boils some water to produce the steam, and then the steam is blown into the turbine. So, this box should be turbine. Then the turbine flows its produced steam into the generator. So, that turbine is actually rotates. Sorry, Bulbul say. Uh, I was mistaken. The turbine actually rotates because of the effect of the steam. And then the rotational energy is transferred to the generator. Where the So, this box should be generator. Typically, you have learned the energy, comp, uh, com, uh, energy output process up till this far. This third box, third empty box, or the fourth box in the whole sequence should be transformer. <clears throat> the reason you don't know this yet, but we'll, we're going to learn details about the transformer thing in our electromagnetism chapter. But one of the things is that to reduce the power loss or heat loss in the wire of a transmission line whenever we are trying to send energy electrical energy over long distances it is imperative that for an, we use an ac ac supply and also that we keep the voltage of the ac at a very high value now why that is important we're going to see about that in our electricity chapter so by the end of your syllabus you'll know all of these reasonings but to make this happen to achieve this high voltage part after electricity is generated in any power station we always send that electric energy into a transformer the transformer is the device which can convert an alternating current into a high voltage low current properties so that's the purpose of the transformer so every power station has their own transformer on site and by which they change the property of the electrical energy and which they supply to the grid grid in this case means the uh, network of transmission lines that is spread across the nation or the country or the region for which that power station is responsible for so this fourth box is going to be transformer you don't know it yet but eventually whenever we'll be finished the syllabus we're going to go through the electricity chapter and then eventually we'll, we'll do the uh, uh, final thing the electromagnetism chapters you'll know this in the content for the timing you don't know it yet but just to make sense with you, I give you a little bit of hint for why this is required. If you forget about this information right now, no big deal. For the time, you just understand that after the generator, the energy will be immediately sent to a transformer, which is required. And then it will be sent as output in the national grid from which the users will be eventually receiving the power. And there are also multiple steps towards it, which we'll discuss in due time. So that's the uh, third empty box. Number B says state one environmental problem caused by the boiling oil to produce electricity. Obviously, the one biggest uh, environmental problem is the pollution due to the carbon emissions. So which increases the uh, atmospheric greenhouse effect, uh, the temperature, average temperature of atmosphere slash earth increases. So that's a big problem. So you can mention one. They mention only one. So you can just be like, right. And uh, you can writing only the pollution might actually not be a good idea because pollution is a very general word uh, i recommend that you write specific outcome of this thing so one of the specific outcome uh, difficulties of this thing can be uh, global warming so you can write the, those two words global warming that's a good word uh yeah all is the non-renewable energy resource why is it i think these two are doable asif yes sir Anything else that you did attempt and couldn't do? Anyone? Number eight, okay. So before I get into number eight, I'd like to discuss this figure a little bit uh, with some uh, 
importance because there are two different uh, leaf design that you're going to come across within this worksheet. One is this, where we have a counter block and we have a leaf box and everything. And then on in over here for an, another of these questions, right, about in here, we don't have the counter. So we're going to talk about these two figures side by side to give a comparative idea that which of this system is better, which of this system is more uh, energy efficient and why. I'm going to discuss these two things side by side. So let me just uh, select this. Oops. Uh, okay, I can actually keep this tab down because we don't need the full screen view right now. Let's copy it. Whiteboard. So this is one of the designs which we're going to discuss. And the other one was here. So let's keep it right here. So <clears throat> let me help you understand this, the significance of these two designs. What you can see over here uh, that this is a lift design where they have used uh, empty elevator. We can see an empty elevator in people and there's a concrete block over here and there is a pulley and there is a motor. The way this whole system works is that if the building is let's say five story tall, let's say there are five levels over here. So this is ground one, two, three, four. So uh, one, two, three, four, that's a five. If the building is five story tall, <coughs> then the length of this wire is gonna be such that when the lift or the elevator box that is on the ground floor, let's say if the elevator box is on the ground floor, somewhere over here, let's say over here, this uh, whole concrete block would be located, if this is the pulley is located over here, somewhere above the level of the floor, that this concrete block would be located somewhere over here at the very top level. And the way this system is designed is that the, the for a regular design, the mass, which also leads into weight, <clears throat> the mass of the concrete block and the mass of the empty elevator box are usually kept equal. Whenever these two things are kept equal, the total force of this whole system is actually neutral because there is equal amount of tension on this cable on both sides. So you don't actually have to spend any energy or you don't have to spend any very uh, magnanimously strong braking system to for the lift to move by. The beauty is that if you want, let's say a person comes in and he or she wants to go to level three, they press the button that part button actually goes uh, transfer the inflow to the motor and then the motor rotates. And as the motor rotates, this concrete block is gonna start going down and this person and plus the elevator box is gonna start going up. So as this box comes down, it is gonna lose some GP. And as this box goes up, it is gonna gain some GP. Benefit is that we don't have to lift the entirety of the box and the person for this whole thing. Let's say the box and the person all together has a total uh, weight of let's say uh, 1000 kg let's say person and box together. If the person goes up to the level three, and if that height of the level three is let's say 30 meter, just taking very unusual number, not 30 meters, let's say uh, two meter, uh, three meter, three is a nine meter. So let's say level three is nine meter, if that's the height, then the beauty is that this, in the process of raising this person, the total GP gain of this whole thing will be 1000 kg into 10, which is the gravitational, uh, potential, uh, gravitational acceleration into nine meter. That gives you a value that is uh, 90,000 joule. So this whole system is gonna be, have to, have to have to gain 90,000 joule just to lift up a person who is definitely much more smaller than this. For example, let's say the person is a very fat person. Let's say the person is 200 kg and the lift is 800 kg. So to lift up a person of 200 kg, you have to give, we have to do much more work. The benefit of having the concrete block is that whenever this whole thing is gonna go up, this thing is gonna come down. As it's going to come down, it's going to lose some GP and through the transfer of their two motion, that GP will be transferred to this thing. So this is going to be losing some GP and that equal amount of loss GP will be transferred to this uh, to this uh, elevator and the person as well. So you don't actually have to do this whole amount of work by exclusively by the motor spending your electrical energy. Let's say the lift comes down and because the lift has a smaller weight than the uh, elevator box right now because the per there is a person inside, let's say for falling the same amount of height of nine meter, let's say the concrete block loses, uh, let's say 80,000 joule energy. Let's say. So if the concrete block loses 80,000 joule energy, which means you 
will own the this amount of energy will be coming from the fall of the concrete block so that will be tra uh, traveling in this part and the remaining part so in this case if we do the subtraction the remaining part is 10000 joule uh, this 10000 joule amount of work or energy has to be exclusively separate from the motor so the motor will have to do only work to make sure that the two things move up and down and only do the work just to lift up the person. The, own, uh, the entire elevator box lifting energy doesn't have to come from your electrical consumption, which makes this system much too energy efficient. Every single time the, uh, the lift goes up, the concrete box goes down. And then again, the, when the con uh, lift, uh, when the uh, elevator box comes down, the concrete box goes up. So there's a continuous shift or transfer of GP from the higher object to the lower object there is a continuous shift so you're already always having a fixed amount of energy available within the system which is practically being transferred and making the whole process much too energy efficient so that's the basic idea for having the concrete block to save energy however if you consider this mechanism here every single time a person has to go up because there is no concrete block all of this energy has to come from the motor so if this person is going from this level to a three level high, similar numbers, let's assume the total ma ma mass of the whole thing is 1000 kg. If this person is also going up less than nine meter, the whole system has to gain a total GP of 90,000 joule. This entire 90,000 joule has to come from the motor, which means the motor will consume at least 90,000 joule from the electrical energy from the supply. And it will have to transfer that energy to the elevator system. So you this the electric bill for this lift would be far too higher compared to the electrical bill of this motor, of this system. So this is actually far too cost efficient, effective and energy efficient. This is the basic theoretical discussion. There's one factor that I totally uh, uh, did not talk about, which I'm, I'm gonna start right now, is what we mean by friction. Well, you have to understand one thing, we have been talking about friction for a pretty long time, that whenever any object moves, whenever there are moving parts within a system, there is always some internal friction within that system. No matter how well you design this thing, no matter how well you lubricate this thing, by designing the system well, by using high high quality equipment with with low friction coefficient, using high grade uh, lubricating oil to reduce the friction even further, you can minimize it. You can minimize it to a very small value, but you can never actually make it zero. Which means any system which has moving parts will always, and I mean always, have some friction, and that friction will always eat up some of the available energy of the system every single time you move something, and that converted energy will be exposed out as heat energy, heat and sound. We preferably avoid the sound because a sound in a moving lift elevator system is not a very pleasant thing, but we cannot avoid the heat outcome, which practically means that every single time, the amount of energy that you have to, I mean, let's say in this case, the subtraction gave us 10,000 joules. So if you are, if you are wonder, does this motor consume exactly 10,000 joule of electrical energy from the supply that for to which this motor is connected? Does it, does it consume exactly 10,000 joules? That answer is a solid no. The motor has to give a net output of 10,000 joule to lift up the person from the ground floor to level three. Net output, which would essentially mean that the motor has to pull in from the supply a bit slightly more than 10,000 joule because in that process, some energy has to go out. So let's say if this in this entire lifting process and this falling process, let's say if the system loses, let's say 200 joule of frictional energy. So this is our loss. The motor will grab or pull a total of 10,000 uh, 200 joule, uh, 10,200 joule of energy from the supply. This will be your input energy of the, of the input energy, input electrical energy to the motor. And the total output or useful output energy will be 10,000 joule. So using these two values, we can essentially calculate some, uh, some efficiency of the motor system or the elevator system. But what I am trying to highlight over here, that every single moving component based device or mechanism or installation will always have some frictional loss which is absolutely unavoidable it can be designed to make this loss pretty small but it can never be made into zero clearly i'm sorry yes sir clearly yes in the first diagram, you said something about the reduction of electrical energy. Can you explain that again yeah sure the motor is uh, what is the type of energy that is that will be fed to a motor electrical energy so Whatever the work that you have to do to lift up the person from the ground floor to the top floor to the level three, that energy, that GP gain has to be transferred from somewhere because the person did gain some height. So energy is conserved quantity. It is not destroyed or created. So that energy has to come from somewhere. That energy is practically comes from the elliptical lines to which this motor is connected. And that elliptical energy through the help of this uh, motor and uh, cable and everything is transferred to the person as GP. Butchik will say. 
sir did you uh, say about the first diagram yeah gp uh, electrical energy will be consumed by all the motor whenever you see that a motor a motor is a basically a device which can convert electrical energy into kinetic energy it rotates and by doing the rotation you can do a lot of things for example in this case that rotation will be responsible to lift up the elevator but if you have some let's some some vehicle which is going on to a straight horizontal road then the purpose of an electrical motor can be to gain kinetic energy so basic idea is that any motor will consume electrical energy and it will give an immediate output as kinetic energy or motion in this case that kinetic energy was actually converted back into gp because something is gained height because you have to understand that elevator simply doesn't run at 10 kilometers to 2200 or, or 100 kilometers per hour it runs at a pretty small speed and it stops every once in a while all that it does is mainly the gp conversion it provides gp to the staffs which is inside to lift them up and whenever people get in from the top floor and goes down it can absorb that gp so whenever things are going down the motor practically doesn't have to do anything it the motor simply has to do the work to overcome the friction so jodi 9 meter uthar jonno jodi amader 200 joule energy total friction loss hoy abar jodi mankor tahole amar top floor theke jodi keu abar niche name tomar kot level 5 theke keu level 3 te namte ase tokhon amader total amount of energy loss hoy 200 joule hobe but oi kese motor shudhumatro 200 joule consume korbe karon namanor jonno to take gp provide korte hocche na automatically gp available hocche the loss of the gp for the person would be basically transferred back to the concrete block so that's that that that's that okay sir bujha gaye sir yes sir yes anyone else any question about this whole thing that i just discussed no nope, apparently okay beautiful so i'm going to go to uh, samira anis problem she gave a number for number 8 so we're going to have a look at number 8 This is was number eight. Okay, let's have a look. Figure eight point one. Figure four point one shows a hydroelectric power station. Water from the lake is used to produce electricity in the turbine house. Okay, state whether where the water in figure four point one has the least potential energy. Least potential energy will be available at the lowest level of the water. In this case, the lowest level of the water is the river level. You can see that the water is actually stored over here, right over here, and from here the water is going to flow through the pipe, falling down, losing GP, and come down to the river level. This is the this will be the level of the river. So, at the river level. <coughs> you will have the least gp uh, i'm going to write river not turbine house not dam not lake i'm going to simply write one word river then it says in 30 minutes the water loses acha it a copy kore nei because we're going to need this thing solve Okay. The question says that in 30 minutes the water loses 5.0 to 10.9 joule of energy and 4.5 to 10.9 joule of electrical energy is produced in the turbine house. Calculate the efficiency of the energy conversion. This is pretty simple. This is the total input. This is the total output. So you just do a ratio of these two things into 100% gives you the efficiency in percentage. Then it says calculate in watts the electrical power output. Power output from the turbine house. So you can have a look. The turbine house produces this much of electrical energy within a duration of how much? 30. minutes not second so you have to divide this whole thing divided by 30 into 60 so that you can get joule per second over here which ultimately gives you some number in and what what is what is already provided over here so you're not going to get a uh, uh, you're not going to lose a mark for a mistake of uh, unit they have already given the unit so you just have to be careful that this was 30 minutes so you have to convert that into 60 at the denominator that's the most common location for the mistake uh this is a power output so we have to use the output power not the input power if they ask for input power then we had we had to use this thing but the time would remain the same in number c it says some power station burn coal to produce the same electrical power output set one advantage of a hard the hydroelectric power station well one one big advantage of the hydro there are a lot of uh, advantage for a renewable power station for example if you ask me uh it has no running cost if you are you know what do i mean by that If you have a coal power station or oil power station, you have to continuously buy coal or oil from the miners or from the mining company to be able to run that plant. If you don't buy those, you can run the plant. So, which means you have a continuous cost of buying this thing. But for a hydroelectric power station, the amount of water that actually comes to the lake is basically pumped through the atmosphere through the solar heating in the entire water cycle that we talked about earlier. So, this is a free energy available from the sun. The sun is not charging us. It's a naturally available thing. So once you set up the whole thing, you have a cost for the building of the dam, setting up the turbine house, everything. But once your installation is done, as long as this thing remains operational, you're gonna get free energy 
uh, without any cost. So it doesn't have any running cost. That's one of the thing. That, but biggest advantage of a, of a hardware repository is that it does not do any uh, greenhouse effect. It does not do any global warming. It doesn't do any environmental pollution. It doesn't excrete ex ex out any uh, pollutant gas like carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen, nitrogen oxide, those kind of things. And these are the advantages. So you could write any of those. In the masking, you'll find a lot of different advantages in region, and you can choose any of those that you want. But I would recommend that you learn all of those things because in some other question, they might say state two advantages. Some question might say state three advantages. So if you learn all of those, for those kind of situations, you'll be in safe hands. Indeed, says state one harmful effect of the hardware repartition may have over the environment. Okay, this is a good one. What could be possibly be a harmful effect of the hardware repartition? There are a couple. First of all, the masking options actually give you some direct, uh, direct or easily understandable options. For example, that if we have some fish that enters to this pipe and gets hit by the turbine house blades, that those blades are made of steel and the fishes are made up of flesh, so they are gonna die. So dead fish is one, apparently one of the problem, but which is actually never a practical problem. Over here, there are always sieves or there are always nets so that fishes and, 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 and solid objects cannot actually enter into the turbine house. So, but if that is not given, we can also have some fish dead. That's one of the most common problem that makes sense to us and easy to remember, but that's not the main problem. You can actually control so that no fish, no fish actually dies over here. That is controllable. The problem that we cannot overcome is that, try to have a look over here. Let me just draw a landscape. Let's say I'm drawing a satellite view of a landscape. Let's say this is a certain landscape that we are talking about. Earlier, there used to be a river that flew like this. This was the actual pathway of the river. Let's say at some point, the government of this, of this, of this country decides that we're gonna make a build, uh, build a dam right over here and make a hydraulic repositions uh, over here. Now, try to understand. The water was initially flowing through this pathway and there was a certain level of the water within the river. The moment you make the dam, you're gonna store some water over here. If you want to store that water, it means you're definitely gonna make, increase the level of the water because you're, you're, you're providing obstruction in, in the natural flow path of the water, incoming water, which is flowing in from the upstream and trying to go downstream. Whenever we make the dam, that this dam will essentially flood significantly large amount of area over here, which is gonna basically make a lake. That's why behind every dam, there is not a river, there is a lake. That lake is an artificial reservoir of water that was built because of the production of the dam. If the dam was not built, the lake wouldn't exist. It was be simply be the pathway of the river. The moment we make a lake, which means a large amount of irrigable lands or cultivable lands or people's houses or any other other stuffs, uh, habitats of animals or forests within this area, they're all gonna be washed up. They're all gonna go underwater and that flora and fauna within this place will be all destroyed. That land that is under this lake would not be practically be available for any practical purposes, which it was earlier. So this is actually a long time unavoidable problem for any hardware power plant. Whenever any hardware power plant is made, you have to experience this uh, loss in habited place, in forest, in uh, people, uh, in replacing those people who are actually living over there. So that's a permanent damage that we cannot avoid. If you ask me, in Bangladesh, we have one hydraulic power plant, which is in Kaptai, Rangamari Kaptai. There was a river flowing in of through this thing. And then we had this hydraulic power plant was irritated at some point. This hydraulic power plant was built in such a location, which was the most optimal location that made the lake, which actually flooded the entire uh, Rajbari. Rajbari means the entire... Uh, Enter King's house, Mane Chakma Raja J Basha Chilo, Pura Prasha Chilo. That whole it was that, that was that valley was entirely that valley entirely went underwater. They tried to oppose it, prohibit it for a very long time, but uh, government decided to make this thing and they actually built that dam anyway. The entire uh, palace went underwater, and that was basically the one of the primary reasons for which in the uh, for which there was a really long dispute and unrest in the in the uh, in the parbotto uh, parbotte in the uh, hilly hilly districts bandaban khagarchu nagamati over a really long time yeah rural bolte jacchen yeah na rural na i'm hilly areas 
বাংলাদেশের তিনটা জেলাকে হচ্ছে পার্বত্য জেলা বলে খাগড়াছড়ি বান্দাবন এন্ড রাঙ্গামাটি সো বিকজ দা দ্য চাকমা চাকমা কিং লস দেয়ার হোল প্যালেস এন্ড দেয়ার হোল ভিসিনিটি অফ দ্য হোল থিং ইট ওয়েন্ট আন্ডার ওয়াটার অল টুগেদার দ্য ভ্যালু ওয়াজ প্লিপ্লেস দ্য गवर्नमेंट মেড এ লট অফ প্রমিসেস টু রিপ্লেস দেম এন্ড एवरीथिंग বাট ইউ ক্যান নেভার অ্যাকচুয়ালি রিপ্লেস হিস্টরি ইউ ক্যান নেভার রিপ্লেস ডাইনাস্টিস দ্যাটস জাস্ট ডাজন্ট ওয়ার্ক দ্যাট ওয়ে সো that was one of the reasons so that's the problem that i'm saying that every single time we make a hard work position you have to accept the fact that a lot of available lands important lands are going to go under water and that's one of the biggest uh, harmful effect of a hard work position if you ask me does it make sense yes sir this this part that i just discussed to you has a lot to do with history and uh, understanding the uh, feelings of people and it actually requires a little bit of background to make sense that's why in most cases this is not included in your in your in your papers and also this gives uh, people a bit more uh, soft spot that we should not then make hard to pass away some people think that uh, it is okay if we die all by flooding after 10 years but we are not going to uh, we are not going to replace some 10000 people from a region right now today so that we can eventually escape from flooding all through after 10 years so some people would prefer uh, are if you ask me are really that much not uh, i can use the word stupid yes i can use the word some people are that stupid that they would not appreciate the possible long term benefit for the sake of a short time problem from some people but well if one thing is always true that any single time you are trying going to try to make some logical development some people will also always be have to affected you are trying to make a road you are make, trying to make a rail line you are trying to expand the road in its width you have to practically replace people trees forests cultivable lands out of its path to to occupy that location so you, you will you, without affect because humans are everywhere right now without affecting certain number of humans you can never make progress so that comes as a cost default cost for any type of permanent development bujhe yes, gaya sir ji sir beautiful any other question that any of you have a question uh, questions about please post in the uh, uh, zoom chat i could actually discuss question number 7 there is a pretty interesting thing to discuss in question number 7 and number 6 also has a pretty pretty nice uh, thing to discuss I think we did discuss number five. I'm pretty sure that we did discuss last you know, five last class. And if I go to other problems, we have some stuffs over here. There is one one thing that I would like to discuss over here. Acha, I'm not actually kichu problem. All of course, yeah. We did discuss number thirteen. Okay, I I would like to discuss this problem that I just showed you. Uh, this one, this one. Uh, there is one thing that I will discuss. It's pretty simple problem, <clears throat> but still there is something some important bit that can be picked up. Hold on, just a second. My kid is really crying. I'd like to check up on her. Just a second. Okay, we resume the recording. I'm gonna. What What I'm interested to discuss in this question is that here it says that figure six point shows a device used to generate electricity. Water entering at the top turns the wheel. A generator connected to the wheel produces electric current. State two main energy changes that takes place in the device as water starts to flow. It is pretty simple that water falls starts falls. So GP converts into kinetic energy because that thing is rotating, and then eventually the kinetic energy will be converted into electrical energy. So I'm going to write over here GP into kinetic. Then I'm going to write kinetic into electrical. Or if you don't want to write the word into, you can give a arrow like this works. GP arrow kinetic, kinetic arrow electrical. <clears throat> then this is a basic mathematical calculation. You can do this, no big deal. Then number C is what I'm interested. In. State two ways in which the device wastes energy. Here are the two ways with which the device wastes energy. You can see when the water is leaving from this wheel. it is falling through this height and the amount of gp that the water actually had over here which is falling just by losing by just by falling this amount of gp is actually not con- actually not captured by this wheel have a look the water is actually falling from in over here so with respect to the water level out you had this much amount of gp available for your every molecule of water or every kg of water here in this process you are only we are only capturing this much amount of gp for available use all of the remaining amount of gp this 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 high to relevant gp is actually getting wasted so you might wonder then what is a logical possible way by which we could possibly capture this energy there is a here is a design have a look let's say if we have a wheel like this and the water run out level is over here and we actually dig a hole we actually dig a hole and place the wheel halfway under this water the 
pivot is placed over at this water level and then the water should fall in right here and the, uh, the water should rotate through this quarter of a circle falling and then the water should run out over here. If we could achieve a wheel situation like this or over here, if this whole wheel was this much big, Uh, this is not a good drawing, but you do understand what I'm going to mean. If the hole was this much big, then maybe we could capture a much bigger sec section of the energy. That's one way the device loses energy. This is one of the things that you have to understand. And the other way is very simple. Like I've always been saying that whenever any de device has a moving part, there is a default friction. Friction produces heat. So you're going to write about that as well. The other question that I'm really, I was really interested to, I'm really interested to discuss from my part is uh, where is the bicyclist one. Did we discuss this bicyclist, bicyclist problem in any of our earlier classes? Can anybody tell me that there was a conversion from his uh, into evaporation and heat? Did we ever discuss this problem? Anyone remember this thing? No, sir, we did not. We did not. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll go ahead. This question is actually not difficult, but there is something that I would like to talk about. So that's why I'm picking up this problem. Here it comes. Beautiful. Few 2.1 illustrates the journey to of a cyclist from point A to point B. Point A and B are the same height. The cyclist starts from rest at A. Very important, rest. The cyclist starts from rest at A and pedals up over a hill. Near the bottom of the hill, she starts to break and comes to rest at B. So here, initial velocity is zero. Here, final velocity is also zero, which means you have to understand here, the starting energy, kinetic energy was zero. At the end of the journey, the kinetic energy is also zero. Based on how the, uh, describe the energy changes that take place as she pedals up the hill at constant speed. Constant speed means what? V is constant. Which means Ke equals to half mv square. That is also a constant because mass of the person is, is an obvious constant. V is constant means the total of this expression is also constant. Which means as the person is going up, there is no change of Ke. But the person is going up. So that person is definitely gaining GP, that GP is actually coming from the stored chemical energy within the person's muscle. So <clears throat> as the cyclist goes up, she actually uses her, the kind of chemical energy of her muscle to gain that GP. So I'm going to write, if you ask me, I'm going to write like this. And also because there are moving parts over here and the person is definitely going through some air, there's always some frictional loss, which is basically heat loss. So what I'm going to write over here is what I'm going to write over here is that uh, chemical energy stored in muscle. I'm going to write why it was stored because the question says describe. Describe actually is a pretty elaborate way of demanding something. So you should write as much as you can that is logically relevant to this process to expect full marks out of this thing. So I'm going to write for this answer. Uh, chemical energy stored in the muscles converts into GP gained of the cyclist and also the cycle because both of them are going up. That's going to be my first sentence. And I'm going to also write some chemical energy is also converted into heat and sound because of the friction of the system. Because of the friction of the system. Do not write because of the friction between the tire and the road. This is this would be wrong. This is not the friction that produces heat. This is required for the person to climb up. Other than this friction, the person will never be able to climb up. So don't mention the source of the friction. You can simply write some energy, some chemical energy is also, also lost as heat energy because uh, heat, uh, heat and sound heat. You can mention sound because whenever the person is going up, there can be some creaking and squeaking in the in their, in their wheels and the mechanisms. Uh, so some chemical energy is wasted as heat and sound uh, because of the friction that exists within the system. This is going to be a full three marks going option. Then number B says, explain how the law of conservation of energy applies to the complete journey from A to B. Explain how the law of conservation of energy applies to the complete journey from A to B. Mark one. So this is what I'm going to write. <clears throat> As the person goes from point A to the top of the hill, chemical energy of the person converts into GP and K. As the person falls down and breaks, that's in, that GP and K converts into heat energy that is dissipated. Breaking produces heat that will be dissipated. So, so chemical energy from the person goes 
as heat energy into the surrounding surrounding ke tumi chale bhenge atmosphere and ground dui ta ke mention korte paro karon break jokhon korbe ekhane jokhon she porar shomoy jokhon she break ta breaking korbe so break korar shomoy amader resultant force kintu kashobe chu pore dike because that's the whole idea of breaking with breaking you actually do what with breaking you actually apply an opposite frictional force on uh, uh, compared to the velocity and that's what helps you to decelerate so that friction in this case is actually helpful for slowing down so the chemical so ultimately or in general overall the chemical energy of the person is transferred to heat energy of the surrounding by equal amount hence the conservation is applied i said a lot of stuffs for one mark you don't have to write all of the stuffs i you said said all the stuffs for make sake making sense but you have to be very careful none of these energies which are involved over here is in i mean the entire initial form of energy was chemical energy of the muscles entire final energy at this level is the heat energy supplied to the surrounding there is no gp gained there is no k gain because the question says the person started at this level and ended at the same horizontal level which means there is no ultimate there is no uh, ultimate gp gain the person started at rest from here and eventually finished over at rest over here which means there is no ultimate k gain so you cannot say that overall change is the chemical energy that was stored in the muscles was converted into or or was transferred into the atmosphere uh, in, uh, to the surrounding bacterial or atmosphere plus, plus ground as heat energy এইটা বুঝা গেছে কিনা এই কনসেপ্টটা বুঝা গেছে কিনা সবার দেখো কার কোন কোশ্চেন Was there any other interesting question that I wanted to discuss from here? This is a very simple one. This is also a very simply doable one. Okay, this one. Uh, here is one thing that I'd like to discuss. This is a pretty, pretty important question. Let me just read through because I don't need this part. I'm going to need this part. Figure three point one shows the student rubbing her hands together. She state the main energy conversion that causes the hands to become warm. State why the hands be become even warmer if they are pressed to harder together when they are rubbing. You can simply write two words. Increased friction. That's it. increased friction i'm going to write two words and that's it and i'll score one mark anyway number c is what i'm interested in have a look let's me copy this part and number c is actually not dif difficult but there is a uh, point of this question where the students are very prone to make a mistake so i'm going to try to alert you so that you don't do that mistake have a look at the question the average force used to slide one hand along the other is 1.2 newton In each movement, one hand moves 0.00 meter. The other hand remains stationary. So what you are, what you should try to visualize is that I'm going to keep the left hand. This is the left hand with the thumb. Let's say thumb is on top. I'm going to keep the left hand stationary, and I'm going to have the right hand. Let me draw that with blue. I'm going to move that right hand moving. So let's say in each movement, this is the right hand with the thumb over here. So they are moving with each other. So this is moving. This is stationary. The question says that. In each movement, one hand moves 0.00 meter. The other hand remains stationary. Calculate the number of movements needed for 2.0 joule of work to be done. This is actually very simple. You can find out what is the total amount of work done uh, by only one movement. One movement means, let's say you keep your left hand stationary. You either remove the right hand from close to you to farther away. That's one movement. Not the full cycle is not one more. In one full cycle, going up and down or going away and close. there is two movement in one movement you are going to do this much amount of work which is the product of these two values and then you just divide that number uh, you just divide 2.00 with that number to get how many number of movements are required eta kora khub difficult question is simple now this is the question for the students make ms the question says each movement takes 0.2 second they they have used the word each this each word has a numerical value it means one movement Calculate the average power developed. Students are just doing it. Sometimes they use two joule divided by two zero point two zero second. Two joule divided by zero point two zero second, and that is the mistake that the students do, which you shouldn't do. If you even do this, you're going to get one mark. You're going to get the first mark. You're, gonna get, you're not going to get the second mark. The reason you're going to get the first mark is that because of the idea that to get the power, you have to divide some amount of energy by time. So basically, by implementing the idea, the power is developed by work over time or energy over time. Because you could detect at least that much, you're going to score that one mark, which is the concept mark or the core mark, or sometimes also given as B one base mark. So you're going to get that mark, but the answer will be wrong. because each movement is not re representing this much energy each movement represents whatever you got from the product of these two numbers that is each movement's energy so 
to solve this thing, you have to use that amount of energy which you did calculate over here, divided by 0.20 second. That gives you the average power of the <laughs> to, uh, uh, power developed. So be careful about the amount of energy that you use for the same calculation. This is the part that I wanted to discuss. Be careful about that. Buchu ki wose? Bhavan? Ji, sir. So if you don't have any more, any more thing to ask, I would, I would jump into the uh, theoretical discussion for the next chapter, which is density pressure. Density pressure is the class one actor. Who is it? This is the last chapter of the... So density pressure is the class one actor. What is the class one actor? No, I don't think so. I think I talked about these shapes, uniform shape thing that I did discuss. And then I also talked about the sprout thingy. Did you talk about the sprout thingy? It's a special case one thing, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We did have a class. Yeah, it's somewhere in your video lectures. I think that we just finished the discussion in the other class and I gave you the homework and we had some time and then we picked up this class. I do remember that we discussed this thing, that why this thing is required to, for overflowing or for an object that is too big to fit into the measuring cylinder, we can use this sprout thingy by overflowing the water in the uh, container and taking that in the measuring cylinder and going forward. Uh, and then we have the formula for pressure. <coughs> and okay, today I'm gonna start from manometer and barometer. I'm gonna go through these parts. Where is the barometer equation? Hi, hi, can a barometer and I can know. Sharbonash. Hold on, I can have the barometer and I. Manometer to last year. Holy shit. Acha Babana. Man barometer on the Likadibo. Barometer Jim all put on the Likabo. Jet on a piece of the copy or Likaniba. But you will see. A connector in Shlako, that of both the same. So by it to cost to Kore Eta Rupore, a connector just a page of fifty one hundred in Shliko. Liko barometer. Notes on last page. Liko barometer notes on last page. Barometer on the daily hitch. Alap Korea. Liko barometer notes on last page. Acha. I mean, I just want to push about, but before I start about the barometer thingy, I would need you to read something. Shita would say. A derivation to two power show by. I'm gonna actually leave from my desk a little bit to check up on my girl, so I'll be back in two three minutes. A take two power, and then I'm gonna start discussing the parameters. Then we're gonna go into manometers. So is in the recording. Couple of things that I'd like to discuss for the parameter thing. So this is the parameter lecture, and I'm gonna tell you what are the stuff that I would like you to write, and what are the stuff that I would like you to draw. I'll <coughs> draw those things very precisely, and I'll dictate what you are should write in the part where you are supposed to take the notes. So until and unless I ask you to write or draw something, just keep watching the lecture and try to understand the content. Precise request. I'll tell you exactly what to write and what to draw to take on your documentation. And this lecture is always, always be available in the upload in the YouTube. So if you need additional stuff later, you can see it later, no big deal. For that I mean, try to understand. And the key thing that we need to understand, one of the primary law that is not included in the syllabus is what is called Pascal's law. I don't know why they didn't include this. is a very weird, simple law. Pascal's law basically says that if we apply pressure on a closed body of fluid, fluid, fluid means liquid or gas. Listen to me, up, hear me up. If we apply pressure on a closed body of fluid, that pressure will be transferred within the fluid in all directions equally. That pressure will be transferred within the fluid in all directions equally. So one of the key important idea of this thing is can be something like this. Let me just show you a figure for Pascal's law. Okay. 
on the idea of passive figure is like this that if we apply some pressure over here this water is going to try to squash out on the physical representation is like this let's say this is a closed air container a closed water container where we have a bulb over here if we do not allow this thing to fall down water will not fall out if we push it down water is going to come out if we lift it up atmospheric air is going to push in and eventually enter into this container similarly it's something over here if we apply some force over here what about the pressure that is developed over here? That same pressure will be developed over in this part as well. To be honest, it will not be developed over only here. This pressure will be applicable all over the place. Within this cylinder, every part of this cylinder, every part of this pipe, every part of this cylinder, the pressure will be available. However, because this piston and this piston are the only movable parts of this whole system. So if you push this piston down, this piston has to go up, having equal pressure. That's Pascal's law, which is not included in the syllabus for reasons unknown to me. Now, here is a visual representation for how Pascal's law works. It simply says that, try to understand that this is how the pressure actually varies for a vertical depth. I'm using that word depth, not height, for a vertical depth from a certain reference level. Let's say if I apply within a one meter square area, if I apply 100 Newton of force, then let's say over here, there are four molecules of water which are taking this force. So this will be applied onto this thing with 25 Newton, 25 Newton, 25 Newton, 25 Newton. 25 Newton. And that pressure would be applied equally by all of these particles. So as the area increases, the pressure remains the same. For every part, the pressure will remain the same. So here's the idea. If you remember the basic core formula for pressure, pressure is given by force over area. Every single part of the fluid or water or oil will have the same pressure, which means if you have a larger area, you simply have a larger force. So that the ratio of these two things gives you the same numerical value of pressure everywhere. Larger area will be subject to bigger force and vice versa, smaller area for smaller force by to produce the same amount of pressure. So this is a very important thing, which is gonna be helpful for our barometer thing as well. The barometer practically looks like this. Uh, we have the typical barometer is developed like this. So we have a container that is filled up with mercury. Let me use black. Let's say it is filled up with mercury up to this level. And we have an upside down, we have an upside down test tube that was initially entirely filled up with mercury. And we're gonna close the open end by our thumb. So what is gonna happen? First, let's say we have this, this whole thing over here. So can I copy this? Uh, copy and paste and I need to rotate this thing. So let's say this was the this was the test tube initially. We're gonna fill it up completely with mercury, liquid mercury. Then we're gonna put our thumb over here or we're gonna do something over, uh, we're gonna place something over here if our thumb is not big enough to close the lid temporarily so that no mercury falls out even if we rotate this thing. And this blue thing is actually a mercury bath. It's a wide open uh, chamber uh, which is filled up with mercury up to this much level. And then we're gonna rotate this whole thing and place it on top of this thing. Uh, so we're going to push the whole thing. Uh, uh, we're going to push the opening of the uh, of the mercury filled test tube into this mercury bath. And then we're going to remove this cover. Interesting thing will happen when we remove this cover. We are assuming that the height of this test tube is pretty long. Pretty long. I'm using the term pretty long for the timing. Uh, be contented with the word pretty long. How much long? I'm going to talk about that just a bit later. Whenever we'll if revert the test tube, then this will, there will two things will happen. You have to understand that atmosphere is continuously pressuring on everything that is in the atmosphere. So what I'm trying to say is that, let's say if we have a uh, ground over here, atmosphere is pressuring onto the ground like this. If on the ground, we have a balloon over here, atmosphere is pressuring onto the ground, atmosphere is pressuring onto the balloon, from all surfaces. So atmosphere, I mean, this is a very basic thing. The whole idea of the way the atmosphere actually produces this whole pressure is because of Earth's gravitational force. Let's say this is the Earth, figure not drawn to scale. And let's say this is the atmosphere, figure not drawn to scale. Okay, beautiful. I love our whiteboard. Wow, they also helped me center this thing. So let's say this is the atmosphere. Now, Earth is continuously because of its gravitational force is attracting on subjects, which means all the atmospheric molecules are also under this attractive force. 
and because of this attraction, they are trying to squash onto the surface from all the directions. And at the lowest level of the atmosphere or close to the surface of the earth, the pressure is highest. And there is a reason for this. The reason for this is that, try to understand, uh, if I give you, try to give you a physical look, let's say if I only try to show you for this much part of that ground and atmosphere, if I zoom in or zoom in on this part, let's say here is the ground, on top, the, on, top of the, on top of the ground, let's say the atmosphere finishes over here. This is hypothetical. The atmosphere actually slowly uh, loses its density. So it slowly van uh, diminishes. But let's say we have an uniform density of atmosphere. If I now divide this whole atmosphere into multiple layers, if I divide the whole atmosphere in multiple layers, what I need to understand, each of these layer of equal dimensions, they have the equal mass. For example, let's say over here we have one kg of air. Here we have one kg of air. Here we have one kg of air. So let's say each of these block has one kg of air over here. And they're all being attracted because of Earth's gravitational force. What you need to understand that at this level, above this level, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight kg of air. So eight kg of air is actually squashing onto that surface. So you're gonna get a, a force that is eight into G divided by whatever the surface area over here. That is the amount of pressure that you're gonna be having, having over here. But what about for this level? What about for this level? How much air is above this level? You have one, two, three, four, five, six kg of air above this level. So the amount of pressure at this level is gonna be six into the gravitational acceleration divided by the equal surface area over here, which basically tells you that as you slowly go up, the atmospheric pressure will decrease. And that's actually what happens. Because as you go further up, you have less air above you and more air below you. The pressure is, is experienced because of the air that you have above you. That's why at the earth's crust, at the earth's surface, you have the highest amount of atmospheric pressure. And if you slowly start to go up and go up significantly, this word significantly is also quite important. I'm gonna talk about this after a while. If you go up significantly, then the atmospheric pressure will start to decrease. Which also brings us to another idea that if we have a balloon, let's say, let me just draw a balloon with blue. Let's say if we have a balloon that is this much big when inflated while it's on the earth's surface, try to understand, if a balloon has a shape of this much and it's not any bigger, what does this mean? That whatever the amount of air that we pushed in, that air is trying to push out onto the balloon. So the air is trying to push out and atmosphere is trying to push in. Whenever these two pressures become equal, that's when the balloon has a fixed size. If we somehow increase the inside pressure by blowing more air, the balloon is gonna get bigger. So it's gonna overpower the external pressure and it's gonna occupy more volume because of the increased air blowing inside. Oppositely, if we do not, let's say, if we do not change the content of this balloon, if we do not change the content of this balloon, simply reduce the pressure outside, then also the balloon is gonna get bigger because if the outside pressure has it becomes somehow, somehow less, then the balloon inside pressure will overpower the outside pressure easily and it will try to expand out. So this is one of these beautiful examples that we have within our worksheet, which I can show you. Uh, I think there is a beautiful experiment that... Oh, come on, I cannot find this. Was it in the MCQ paper? That balloon thingy? I'll have a look. I'll show you what, I, what I'm trying to show you. Don't worry. I don't see it here, but that was a pretty interesting example for the balloon experiment thingy. Okay, uh, let me just try to find it in Google. So this is one of these examples that this is the actual this is the example. A bell jar, a bell jar is actually a device, actually a jar that was initially uh, uh, used or developed to represent that sound is a mechanical wave that it requires air medium to for the sound to pass from one place to another place. Money by constituent, this is basically a strong glass dome 
inside which you can look and the bottom of this dome is connected to a suction pump or vacuum pump. The way this experiment works is that, let's say initially there is no pressure. There initially there is no pressure, uh, which means initially the pump is off and we, you can lift up this uh, glass container, uh, glass cover very easily. So, so we're gonna lift that up and then uh, we're going to uh, put inside the bell jar a uh, partially inflated balloon, partially inflated. It means that uh, there is a balloon which we blown into by a little bit and then we tied up the knot over here so that the air that is kept within this balloon cannot escape. That volume, that mass of air or the number of molecules of air that is inside the balloon remains constant throughout our, throughout our uh, experiment. And then we're gonna keep it into the, inside the bell jar and close the lid with the strong glass uh, encapsulment. And then we're gonna start the pump, vacuum pump. That vacuum pump is gonna to try to pull out air. So this air that the vacuum pump is gonna pull out is gonna be leaving from this much space. This location's air is gonna be slowly going out, not the air inside the balloon. As a result, the pressure over here is gonna reduce and to balance that pressure, this air is gonna to start to expand up. And slowly but surely we'll see that this balloon, even though we're not blowing inside, this balloon is gonna get bigger. The reason it's gonna get bigger is because the balloon is only going to maintain its volume such that the pressure inside the balloon and the pressure outside the balloon are exactly equal. If you blow in the balloon, then what we do, we increase the size pressure of the balloon and that's why the balloon becomes bigger for a regular balloon blowing uh, experience. But in this case, we are not actually blowing in the balloon. What we are doing is we are reducing the pressure surrounding the balloon. We are reducing the pressure surrounding the balloon as a result to compensate for the pressure difference the gas that is inside the balloon is gonna expand up and eventually make the balloon bigger. This is pretty interesting. And the same thing is equally applicable for human beings as well. For example, let's say, or, or for this atmosphere example as well. So what I was trying to show you is that if we have a balloon, I want to select this whole thing. Okay, how can I, okay, I can have to select it by this one. So let's say I'm gonna select this whole thing. Come on. Uh, okay. So whenever this thing is right over here, let's say at, at, at our Earth atmosphere, the balloon has this shape. If we slowly start to take it above, this balloon is gonna start getting bigger. Can I make it bigger? I cannot make it bigger. Plus. Okay, I simply cannot do this over here. So the whole point of copying was actually wrong. So let me just draw over here. If we have a if we have a balloon at our surface that has this much size, if you slowly go up, the balloon is simply gonna get bigger in size. The reason is that the further higher you go, that same balloon is gonna be experiencing less atmospheric pressure. And to compensate this, the balloon has to expand outwards so that the inside pressure of the balloon also reduces so that the pressure can comp can can actually become equal. And that's why the balloon will increase. This is one of the very key reasons that astronauts do need a very special suit. Because you have to understand that our body, our human body is a composite material. I'm using the term composite to give an idea that our body is made up of solid substances, that's the bones, which is made up of liquid substances, for example, blood and lymphs and other stuffs, and urine and other stuffs. Uh, it is also composed of air within the lungs and also within our uh, within our blood vessel, there is dissolved gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, they're all in, ga in gases, gases. So it's a composite material, especially the lungs is actually completely a uh, air chamber. The lungs are completely an air chamber. Here is a, here's a very nice example for how the lungs work. I mean, whenever we breathe in, this is the, this rubber sheet is actually represent this whole thing, this whole glass jar is actually a representation of a rib cage. Let's say that rib cage is a stationary structure. Actually, it's not, but constantly it's a stationary structure. And this rubber sheet that is uh, 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 ribbon at the bottom represents our, it is any key in English, I forgot to Diaphragm. Diaphragm, exactly, the diaphragm. That, that, that is the dividing layer between the chest and the belly. So, when, so, and these two small balloons, blue balloons that are currently over here represents the actual lungs. So whenever we pull this rubber sheet down, the pressure over inside this thing decreases because there is no way that atmospheric pressure can actually fill up this void. So to compensate for that pressure difference, these balloons have to volume up and the air should from the through this tube should go in. This is what happens when we breathe in. Whenever we breathe in, the diaphragm goes down and our lungs get filled up with air. That's when oxygen goes into the blood, carbon dioxide is released from the blood. And, and then as we exhale out, 
this thing happens and carbon dioxide enriched air comes out and the lungs become smaller and this cycle keeps on happening and slowly we and that's how we breathe this is also an a practical application for that pressure is very important for us the idea of pressure is very important for us from a very early time and the, the reason i'm telling you this is that if the astronauts do not have a very special suit which is a pressure and temperature control suit if we just throw a basic regular human being in their bare state in the space the lungs are simply going to rupture into pieces because all the air that is that was kept within their lungs are not going to be pressurized by the atmosphere of the outside so because in the space there is no atmosphere but 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 in on earth our muscles our bodies are squashed in by the atmosphere from all directions so we have a very comfortable pressure level our body's biological systems are accommodating for that atmospheric pressure so we are at, adapted we are adjusted to that pressure level but if we now suddenly get into a zero atmosphere pressure level then all the air that is within our lungs and they're going to start to expand outwards and that's going to happen and as a result the person is simply going to pop like a balloon and immediately dead off obviously <laughs> so that's what is going to happen so that it doesn't happen they have to wear special suits within that suit there is artificially uh, pumped in air in a leak proof mechanism so that their body actually experiences that physical pressure from the outside so that they do not actually explode within that suit but if that suit gets a leak sooner or later they are going to explode bujhat se porjonto any question so far anyone no okay if you have any question please just raise your hand so this is the basic idea of pressure how it works so if i am going to go back to the idea of, of barometer but before i go into that one other thing that i would like to show you is that the expression for pressure under a liquid is given by this expression p equals to h rho g g is the gravitational acceleration 10 meter per second square rho is the density of that liquid h happens to be defined as this thing depth of the level from open surface what i mean is this thing let's say we have a container that is filled up with some water water has a density of 1000 kg per meter cube that's the typical value that we always use uh, water actually has this exact density at 4 degrees celsius which is the highest density of water we talked about this earlier as well now if we measure the pressure of this of this container at this level we are going to measure atmospheric pressure atmospheric pressure is about 10 to the power 5 pascal this is the value that we're going to use it is also said to be one bar bar is not an si unit it's just a practical unit that bar how many bars one bar means one atmospheric pressure more bars means more pressure less bar means partial vacuum so if we measure somehow the pressure at this level that pressure is exactly atmospheric pressure now if we go down let's say if you want to measure the pressure uh, at this level what will be the available pressure of this level let's say this depth is 5 cm what will be the pressure over here the level the pressure at this level is going to be the combined pressure of atmosphere that is working on the surface plus the pressure produced by this amount of above why height liquid so h in this case is actually representing the depth of this level from the open surface 5 cm is not actually the height of this thing it is actually the depth from the open surface that's how it's easier to remember so the pressure at this level can be calculated like this the pressure over here should be 10 to the power 5 the default atmospheric pressure plus 0.05 this is the meter converted for centimeter into 10000 into 1000 which is the h rho g eta hocche h eta hocche rho tar sathe abar g eta ko pura puri calculate kore if we, the number that we get after this whole calculation in terms of pascal will be the pressure of this level if we go deeper if we go deeper everything in this equation will remain same only this number will become bigger so this total value will also become bigger does this idea make sense এই আইডিয়াটা বুঝছো কিনা एवरीवन প্লিজ রেসপন্ড সে ইয়েস অর নো ওকে টু রেসপন্সেস এনিওয়ে আই होप ইউ ডিড আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দ্যাট 
this is one of the key ideas that is used for a barometer. So let's get back to the idea of barometer. Here's a barometer figure, what, what you should remember that whenever we're gonna place this bar mercury filled barometer, let's say the, bar the barometer is completely filled up with mercury. I'm gonna use this ash color thing to represent bar uh, mercury, let's say. So let's say this whole thing is filled up with mercury along with this whole, uh, whole uh, mercury bath. As we remove this bottom, uh, this closer, then this mar this mercury within this uh, within this test tube will have an option to flow out. Will it flow out or not is dependent on the pressure. Fluid will always flow any fluid, gas or liquid. A fluid will always flow from its high pressure region to its low pressure region to re rebalance the pressure. Fluid will always flow from the high pressure region to the low pressure region to rebalance the pressure. Or if they cannot flow for whatever obstruction that we said, they're always gonna try to do that. Fluid will never flow from a low pressure region to a high pressure region naturally. If you have to do that, you have to develop some mechanism to make that work. Same, heat, is, heat also works the same way. Heat will always tra travel from high temperature to low temperature, simple. If you want to transfer heat from low temperature to high temperature, you have to do some extra things. That's what we do in our refrigerators. Because the way refrigerator works is that we continuously take heat from the stuff that is kept inside the refrigerator and push that heat out in the atmosphere. We do that. So it might appear in just bl uh, blind view or just looking at it that, well, refrigerator is a magical device which is continuously transferring heat from cold temperature to high temperature. Well, that's true. That's the overall uh, overall purpose of the refrigerator. But to make it happen, it actually does some pretty magical stuffs, which we are not discussing in this chapter. We're going to see it in the heat chapter. Anyway, so this liquid, this mercury that is kept in the barometer, now has the opportunity to flow out if it requires. But whether it's going to flow out or not depends upon the pressure. Depends upon which pressure. Have a look. This entire level of the mercury, whether connected to the atmosphere or whether connected to the inside mercury, this entire level of the, of the mercury will have the same pressure all over. Which means all of these surfaces currently has a fixed pressure value of 10 to the power 5 Pascal. All of these open surfaces has a fixed pressure value of 10 to the power 5 Pascal. The barometer will also behave in such a way so that the pressure created at this level due to the mercury that is on top of it must also be 10 to the power 5 Pascal. Must also be 10 to the power 5 Pascal. So if I just try to calculate that out, so 10 to the power 5 Pascal equals to possible depth of the mercury or the height of the mercury column, because in this case it is above this our, our uh, reference level. So depth of mercury level uh, into density of the mercury into G. And if I place the density of mercury, which is about, I think, 386000 kg per meter cube, I'm not sure, I forgot. Density of mercury. Sorry, 13593. So 13593. Or let's say 13593. Uh, so let's say 13600, about 3 SF value. This is the density of the mercury. And if we place G over here, which is 10, and here we have 10 to the power 5. Can someone do the calculation and tell me what will be the likely value of H using all of these numbers? Please do this calculation and give me a value for this one in a bit long decimal places. We get zero point seven three five two nine. Akon A number Tamra Patsi, Kanu Chamra Value was a silamuche eta from the net. Our Ekanaja Matinu five bars eta who checked approximated value. None of these values are exactly accurate. If I take exact numbers, for this equation, let me just, I'm gonna write over here. If I take exact numbers, actual atmospheric pressure in Pascal is 101.325. To convince you, I'm gonna show you, show you.
have a look. Atmospheric pressure has a value of 101325 Pascal. That's the atmospheric pressure. And density of mercury is 13593. So if we use these exact numbers, equals to H into 13593 and the actual uh, gravitational acceleration that we use as a standard value for the for the whole 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 earth not localized localized values are slightly different more or less depending upon multiple factors the standard value that we use is 9.81 it actually goes further it is actually 9.80665 okay because we are doing a precise calculation just place 9.80665 i'm going to show you that this is also the appropriate value for g so i'm going to show you value of g uh g here we go the standard gravitational value or uh, i guess standard value for the gravitational acceleration is 9.80665 this is the uh, value up to a very high decimal number so up to fifth decimal place so if i now use all of these numbers to the exact precise value what what number do i get from here can somebody do this calculation and tell me this number or write this number in the chat i appreciate this Someone. কত আসছে কেউ কি নাই যারা এটা একটু লিখে দিবে আমার আই রিয়েলি ডোন্ট ওয়ান্ট টু টাইপ দিস ইন স্যার আই গো 0.76 নট শিওর 0.76 ইজ সাপোজ টু বি দা নাম্বার দ্যাটস হোয়াট আই এম ট্রাইং টু গেট বাট গিভ ক্যান ইউ গিভ মি আ বিট মোর ডিসমেল প্লেসেস 0.7 598 এন্ড দেন মুস্তাফা বিট মোর 0.759 0.76011 Did you write everything exactly that I wrote 80665 and everything? Yes sir I did. Then why is Mustafa getting a different number? Okay you tell me what did you what you got? 0 0.76 0.76011 11 730510 Okay I said a bit, lot of additional places. Mustafa, uh, I'm not sure who you are and it's correct you are Mustafa, but we're going to get a number like this. So the idea is that if you use all the true values, the approximate value for the height, typical height for a barometer, which should be able to hold the atmospheric pressure. I'm using the term hold means that the height of the mercury from here up to here, assuming that the mercury level is going to fall by this much this part of the uh, this part of the chamber is going to become void of anything the mercury is simply going to fall from the original of this place and simply going to uh, keep this thing at zero pressure because there is actually nothing so or you can say this is a perfect vacuum uh, so over here the atmospheric pressure is zero pascal and the total pressure that is going to be produced underneath this mercury column is going to be produced over here Logically, that pressure and this pressure should be equal, and that is only available if the height of this mercury column is this much. So, for ease, for the sake of ease, you, we write this as 76 centimeter, and that's the value we usually take, which means a barometer is basically an upside down test tube that was earlier filled up completely with mercury, and then when let go to flow the allow the flow of mercury out, it will maintain a height of mercury within the barometer. That is a vertical height, vertical, very important. That is a vertical height of 0 0.76 meter. And this is basically the device that mark, that the barometer is. We are actually not measuring the pressure of the atmosphere directly because measuring the pressure of the atmosphere directly would require us to measure the exact weight that atmosphere applies on a certain surface and divide that weight by that area that would be the exact direct way to measure the atmospheric pressure, which is actually quite impossible. I mean, how would you measure how much uh, air is actually squashing in? 
uh, it's not essentially impossible. It's actually pretty difficult. A more easier way is this thing. This is an indirect method. I'm using the term indirect because technically speaking, in this mechanism, P equals to H rho G. What is this equation? P equals to H rho G. P equals to H rho G. In this expression, we're actually measuring the pressure that this amount of mercury is creating at its bottom, at this level, not at the bottom, at this level, at the same level. We are not actually measuring how much pressure is over here. We're actually measuring how much pressure is over here. And by logic, by Pascal's law, we understand that the pressure over here produced by the atmosphere should be exactly equal, precisely equal to the pressure produced over here by the mercury column over here. As long as we understand these two properties, we can essentially do what? We can essentially compare these two things and express that atmospheric pressure in terms of the mercury column. So one other way to write atmospheric pressure can also look like this. Oops, 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 no, 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 no. I'm not trying to get a full design. Okay, one other way to write the atmospheric pressure can look like this. We can write atmospheric pressure as about 10 to the power of five Pascal. This is one expression. We can write it as one bar. This is also another expression. We can also write it as 76 centimeter Hg. This centimeter Hg basically means this expression actually comes from the barometer. That, which means if we have a free 76 centimeter mercury column, the amount of pressure that a 76 centimeter tall mercury column will produce at its base or at its bottom. And I'm using the term free, meaning that the top surface has vacuum on it. That pressure is also equal to atmospheric pressure. So sometimes we can write it in this matter, or we could also do that, change the unit. We can also write it as 660 millimeter mercury. So millimeter, sorry, I forgot that right. A second, millimeter mercury. So this, these are also ways to express atmospheric pressure. A porjunto barometer discussion ta clearly shoba kache bujha gase kina. Any questions so far? I, I think no, since none of you are responding. So the other thing that I, now, now comes the interesting part. Have a look. This parameter figure is actually pretty messed up. So I'm going to try to draw a new parameter and ask you some set of questions. And I'd like you to respond. Everyone, I want you to respond, even if you don't want to share your answer because you feel like that you are a special person or that we are not special enough like you. It's okay. But keep the answer in your head. And whenever I'm going to discuss, if you should try to understand whether it's correct or not. And if you're not correct, you should... If you don't understand my explanation, you should ask me. So let's say this is a barometer that we have made and the mercury level of this barometer is up to this much. So this is a filled up mercury level within this part. Let's say the question has given us four levels. Level A, level B, this bottom end of the test tube is level C, and let's say this bottom level of this base is the level D. Uh, okay, no, never mind. I, I let's not label that as D. Let's say let's. Uh, I'm gonna label this one as D. So labeling like you have second level, what does it mean? D is the top end of the test tube, the peak of the glass test tube. A is the mercury level inside the test tube. B is the mercury level of the bath, and C is the end point of the test tube that is submerged within the mercury bath. Now comes the question. Let's say on any day, on a standard day, the height, we do, we just discussed that the height of AB, let's not write H. Let's say the length of AB for a regular day would be 0.76 meter. And if atmospheric pressure increases, What will happen to these four levels? You have to answer in terms of either going go up, go down, or remain same. If atmospheric pressure increases on a different day for whatever uh, meteorological reason, what will happen to level D? Someone respond. Sir, is level D the tip of the tube? 
Yes. And also, uh, just to make just to make sense with you, although it's not drawn in the figure, although it's not drawn in the figure, you should understand that this test tube is not actually free floating over here. It's not held by the strength of the mercury. For this whole setup to work, there should always be some stand and clamp mechanisms beside this whole thing that will be holding this test tube on its two sides. So the test tube is kept at a fixed position. It's not drawn, but it is taken for understanding. It's taken for uh, granted that you understand the existence of a uh, support system. So the test tube is held in place. So if the atmospheric pressure increases, what happens to level D? Should it change? Should it, should it go up? Should it go down? What do you think? Anyone? No one? Well, uh, yes. Um, it's the test tube is in a fixed position, so shouldn't D be in the same position? Exactly. Atmospheric pressure will affect on the mercury surface. Atmospheric pressure will not actually physically be able to change the position of the test tube because it is held stationary by the help of a clamp. So, which means no matter what happens to atmospheric pressure, level C and D will always remain unchanged. Level D is the tip of the test tube, level C is the bottom of the test tube. No matter what happens to atmospheric pressure, level C and D will not whatsoever go under any change. This is a rule of thumb because they are held in place by physical support systems. Now, what will happen to level A if atmospheric pressure goes up? rises it will rise why because there'll be more pressure over here which will basically push in some of this marker into the tube and to man manage the, this more pressure you should remember that from the form of p goes to h to g if the pressure goes higher you your density of the marker is not changing your gravitational acceleration is also a constant so if pressure goes higher to balance that pressure you simply need a bigger h of the mercury column so that h should increase so which means level A should go up. What happens to level B? It goes down. That is the correct answer. It goes down because if some of the mercury of the mercury bath, which already used to be part of the mercury bath, has now entered into the tube, then obviously the level of this mercury bath should go down a little bit. Now, you should understand the rise of this place over here, the, the amount of rise over here should not be equal to the drop over here. That's not going to happen because the, you have to understand that if if delta V amount of mercury enters into the test tube, it's going to be relevant to the cross-sectional area of the test tube multiplied by the height rise of the test tube mercury column. And that amount of mercury is going in from the bath into the test tube, which means the drop of height for the mercury level on for the bath would be the cross-sectional area of the bath, which means this whole cross-sectional area, like this whole base area, multiplied by the height drop of the bath. So this is definitely largely bigger compared to this one. So the rise of mercury column over here should be really visible or it should be pretty large or significant. Whereas the fall of this level might not be that visible, but obviously there will be some drop. But the amount of drop for this mercury bath will be less compared to the amount of height rise for the mercury column inside the test tube. Do we understand this part so far? Okay. Now I'm gonna pick up pick up on each of you individually and randomly, and I'm gonna ask you some other questions regarding this expression. Have a look. Uh, Ibtisam, try and answer me. If the atmospheric pressure increases, what happens to the length AC? Ibtisam. Uh, so I don't know. Okay, have a look. What I just discussed that level D and level C remains unchanged, right? And if atmosphere yes. goes up, level A rises and level B drops. So I'm asking you what happens to the length of AC? I mean, if you measure by ruler, the height difference between the C level and the A level, what happens to that length? So it will increase. Precisely. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. But do you understand this thing now? 
So can we explain once more? Did you understand? Uh, DNC will be unchanged. Did you understand this part? Uh, say, yeah. If you say no, I'll explain it. No video. I'm just trying to pinpoint from where I should start. You did understand why DNC are constant, right? No. Hello. Give this up. Sir, have all feet. Acha, acha. I, I, I couldn't hear you. So now we have to look that if the pressure of the atmosphere increases, what, what should happen to level A and B? This is the part that we are going on. If the atmosphere pressure increases, there'll be increased pressure on this open surface, and that's going to squash down the mercury level. That will result in some of the mercury from the bath to enter into the test tube. So this level will rise up, and this level will fall down. But it will have more rise, and it will have less fall. But ultimately, A will rise, and B will fall. For an increased atmospheric pressure, these are the two changes that will happen, whereas D and C level should always be constant. I am looking at that. Is it all right now? Okay, sir. So essentially, the the length AC or the distance AC will increase. So you just said distance AC will increase. Beautiful. Next person, Sami. Uh, do you properly understand what will happen to the length BC if the atmospheric pressure increases? Yes, sir. What happens? Sir, it will decrease. Good. Uh, Aris, can you tell me what will happen to the level BD? Not really. It would be great if you could explain again. Which part? The change in length. I did not change the length. I'm asking about the change in length. I discussed about the change of levels. There are four levels that I labeled over here: level A, B, C, and D. Level means horizontal height or horizontal reference line. I said that D and C are the structural part. Location of the whole setup. This is the tip of the test tube, and C is the bottom of the test tube. So these two things are not affected by atmospheric pressure, where the A is the level which is going to rise up for an increased atmospheric pressure, and B is the level that is going to fall down because of atmospheric pressure. I'm asking you to ask me, answer me, that what will be the length change for the length BD? Have a look at the figure and try to figure it out. What happens to BD if atmospheric pressure increases? Okay, let me help you more. What happens to D level D? What happens to the level D when atmospheric pressure in, uh, increases? What happens to this one? Aris. What change does level D experience because of atmospheric pressure increase? I think Aris just joined some other class because it's already 7:33. Anyway, kids, some of you were not asked a question. Don't be disheartened. You will be pulled up. Uh, I'm pausing the class for the for for the time for today's class. Are you mother? Kiki, act the way, like the way. She said, "I'm not going to save it. I'm going to save it so that we can take reference from here for drawing or for this this next class." So today's class is over. Our our time is over. I'm going to next Friday. Then next Friday, I'm going to show you class. I'll make sure that I'm present. So see you uh, then. For the timing, Allah Hafiz. Oh, acha. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah, uh, uh,